David Rockefeller batted John D. Rockefeller Jr. aside, Dan Okren tells us, and the Rockefellers learned nothing from Rockefeller Center. And it's not true. <laughs> what I would like to argue is that Lincoln Center is a clear response to Rockefeller Center. And though you may think of one as a model of excellent urbanism and the other uh, an example of deficient urbanism, in fact, in many ways, they are their twins. John D. Rockefeller III was not the only one who learned from Rockefeller Center. So too did Robert Moses. And they were the two forces that brought Lincoln Center into being. So let me tell you what they learned from Rockefeller Center and how it played out at Lincoln Center. And uh, first, Robert Moses. As Rockefeller Center approached completion, Mayor Fielbrello LaGuardia turned to Robert Moses, his park commissioner, and a big thinker about city planning, if not that in title, and asked him to evaluate a project to create a cultural arts campus just north of Rockefeller Center. The fact that the Metropolitan Opera had been unable to build a new house in Rockefeller Center was much on the minds of Mayor LaGuardia. And though his taste went to more popular forms of opera, he still saw it as a failure that a new opera house had not been built. And that was one of the key components of this cultural center that Moses was asked to evaluate. Two theaters joined together and connected on axis with a new mid-block street that was to be cut to connect this cultural com compound with Rockefeller Center. And Moses wrote to say, this was a foolhardy idea. It was a foolhardy idea to bring together two great cultural buildings because there was no point in concentrating these theaters in one site. A surprising argument, I, you must think, for Moses to make. And the other point, he thought, was that the audience for operas was diminishing. Why create an opera house at all? But by the time we get to 1950, Moses learned enough about New York City real estate to see how difficult it was for a not-for-profit entity like an opera house to build itself anew in New York. The fact that even with a patron like the Rockefellers and a, a, a center like Rockefeller Center, that they could not create an opera house and needed to defer to commercial pressures there, he came to understand that it was necessary for government to intervene in order to realize cultural projects, in order to create an opportunity for not-for-profit entities to thrive in New York City and make a way in this crazy real estate market. And his intervention, Moses' intervention in the making of Lincoln Center, which was not an original idea of his, it was, re it was the realization of an idea that was just below the surface, pent up frustrations, that the Opera House, that Philharmonic Hall, that other cultural projects could not get off the ground because of land costs. It was Moses who realized that the urban renewal program created an opportunity to do just that. So the failure to build a new metropolitan opera house at Rockefeller Center was an important stimulus in the creation of Lincoln Center to create a platform for not just that opera house, but to build, to create synergies by joining it with Philharmonic's, uh, the, the symphony orchestra, and ultimately, as you know, the other cultural entities, including the library for the performing arts on that site. Moses, of course, believed in the necessity of a powerful leader to integrate complex projects. And the most successful urban renewal projects that he was able to push along were those where he had a partner of that sort. Lincoln Center would not have come into being were it not for John D. Rockefeller, 
who may have been swatted away by David at Rockefeller Center, but who saw the powerful impact that a visionary leader could have. Lincoln Center is the realization of his gentle, but nevertheless forceful guidance of that project. For without his intervention, you would not have had a build a, a complex of buildings that had a high architectural ambition. One of the things he learned from that family example at Midtown was that having a collaborative team of architects, as you heard Bill describe, having a collaborative team of outstanding architects was a crucial element in, in creating a significant urban space. So unlike the other projects where Moses, where Moses had a strong hand and were, which were not mostly impressive, as works of urban design, Lincoln Center did involve, thanks to John D. Rockefeller III, a group of architects with Wallace um, Harrison in charge, overseeing this unruly crew and driving to completion a set of buildings of distinction. Rockefeller Center went against the urban grain in some respects. You've, of course, heard and experienced the way it's connected at street level, and, and, and James, in particular, just evoked for you the ways in which its um, subdivision of large New York City blocks into six smaller ones helped to create a yet more dynamic urban fabric. But it went against the grain of New York, nevertheless, in grouping these blocks together, creating if not a mega site, a, a, a mega block, a mega project, and in the idea of creating an architectural composition in the way that James so eloquently evoked. So instead of these set of buildings that really didn't respond or talk to one another, they did just that. And part, of course, of this project was carving out a public space, what eventually became the ice skating rink and the small plazas. And that was another important lesson that was learned from Rockefeller Center that was carried forward into Lincoln Center, that in the grid of New York, there were no built-in opportunities to carve out public space. And in the prevailing language of urban design in the 1950s, the way to do that was within the context of the mega block. So yes, streets were annihilated, 62nd and 63rd streets were closed in to create that platform, that is Lincoln Center. And yes, it turned inward and created the Berlin Wall that Dan referred to. But what it also did was to carve out a set of public spaces that secured a ground for congregating in ways that the street alone did not permit. So you may not think it as dynamic or as compelling as the spaces in Rockefeller Center, but it was that idea that was translated in Lincoln Center in the creation of the main plaza and the North Plaza in particular, and ultimately in the vision, though poorly executed, of the platform that spans 65th Street to connect the main plaza and uh, the Juilliard School to the north. Those are the, the anti-urban Laws, you might say, that are now uh, being remedied in the uh, in the renovations and the revisions underway at Lincoln Center. But the impulse to carve out a, a kind of uh, urban space, a plaza, a piazza, that belonged uh, to all kinds of people, that that was an impulse that Lincoln Center attempted to achieve. So, the lessons of of Rockefeller Center were translated in, in Lincoln Center. Look not at the change of urban form from skyscraper to low-rise structure, but think about the idea of congregating buildings and rescuing public space for uses, non-commercial uses, and think also about the, 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 the difference between the commercial, the commercial aspect of Rockefeller Center and the challenge of creating these cultural institutions, which was achieved at Lincoln Center. The mega project was something that simply was not achievable without a controlling force, 
with economic power and the integrative authority that was demonstrated at Rockefeller Center. But in the aftermath of that project, what kinds of opportunities in New York existed for that to occur? The, the earlier examples of projects of this sort were done by major corporations. You've heard about Grand Central, although that's a <coughs> building site that was established even before the city was built in around it. The real precedent for this kind of clearance uh, project with the uh, accretion or the uh, uh, major land assemblage operation to create a mega, pro a mega site, a, a multi-block site, was Pennsylvania Station. There you had a major corporation uh, bring to completion in 1910 a project that not only erupted above ground level in this, that major building, Pennsylvania Station, but a subterranean network of transportation infrastructure funded not at all by the government, which seeded only the street bed, one street bed, two blocks, two blocks long, 32nd Street. That was a privately financed venture. So too, Rockefeller Center. But what in the post-war period? Who, who was there to undertake such large-scale projects? And this is where the federal government, through the Urban Renewal Program, and the private developers who who stepped in were able to collaborate in remaking the urban fabric. The consequences were not always happy, but they do pose this dilemma of how could large-scale projects happen to change the character of a neighborhood. The, the district of tenements that Carol evoked in her opening remarks of brownstones that were replaced by the towers of Rockefeller Center, that renewal clearance and then renewal project was the precedent for the renewal projects of the 1950s and the 1960s. And Lincoln Center is, you should see, the direct descendant, the direct descendant of Rockefeller Center. And it poses, I think, a challenge to us now as you think about the mega project still on the table, the subject that Alex Gorman, I believe, will turn to. because. These are now developer-driven projects, and we have to ask once again, how is the public interest, how is the public realm advanced in these projects? You may quarrel with certain urban design features of Lincoln Center, but it stands for that challenging dilemma that we face, that we face in New York City, how public institutions uh, make, it, make their way and blossom in the city where real estate is so expensive. Thank you.